Welcome to the Perspectives on Healthcare podcast, where members of the medical community from different roles, venues, and locations share their unique perspectives on quality healthcare, its future, and how to improve it. Now, from the Your Keynote Speaker Studio in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, here is your host, Rob Oliver. Thank you and welcome. I appreciate you being with me today for another perspective on healthcare. Today's perspective comes from Melinda Schulteis. She is out in Iowa. She is a member of Generation Y, which makes her a millennial, and we will not hold that against her. Um, she is an executive director of, at, I always get the initials mix, mixed up mixed up on this. Well, here's what I'm going to say. Melinda, welcome to the podcast, and you tell me what you're a the executive director of. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Melinda. I am the executive director of a continuing care retirement community is what that acronym stands for, it's a mouthful. In addition to that, I'm also an adjunct professor. So I'm an ex executive director by day and a professor in the evening. And I teach courses at our local area community college as well as at an online business school in Barcelona, Spain. So quite diversified. And I teach aging services. So I teach how to be an executive director and which I've been doing for nearly a decade. And there's a definite need for it, especially in the long-term care environment right now. So that's my, those are my two positions that I currently hold. Okay. So when you talk about continuing care, um, what does that, what does that mean? Does that, um, I'm assuming it's different than a nursing facility. It's not a skilled nursing facility that, um, talk to me about that continuing care um, center. Sure. So continuing care means that we are helping people to age through the continuum. And what that means is we have an independent living section on site. We also have an assisted living, and then we have the long-term care or the skilled facility on site as well. So the, the ideal scenario would be that someone would move into independent living and as they age and need more care, they would progress through to assisted living and then ultimately would end up in the health center where the highest level of care is at. So that is what the idea of the continuum care retirement community really is. Okay. So let's talk about your role a little bit, please. Um, you're teaching other people how to do what you do. And yes. in doing that, um, is it more, is it more the skills that are involved? Is it more the outlook that's involved? What would you say kind of, where's the balance in that? Um, that you see as a between skills and kind of the the manner in which it's conducted? So that's a great question. So when I went through the training to become an administrator, I learned the skill sets. I learned what the positions were that I was going to manage. I learned what the different apartments were. I looked, I learned roughly what my day to day was going to be and what things I needed to do to keep us in state and federal compliance. What they don't teach you is how to manage and lead people. So obviously most jobs, a lot of that or those skill sets are on the job experience, but that piece of the job is very much forgotten on the front end, which is what happens to be the most vital part in my mind. I spend about 80 to 90% of my day managing the staff and their needs. And that in turn translates into quality patient care. But I was ill-prepared based on the training that I had. And, I, and in the state of Iowa, they require you to have 720 hours of training mm. in order to be licensed in the state. So I had a lot of hours of training in each department to understand the skills of the job. What I didn't have was the ability to manage the direct care staff, which happens to be the most challenging aspect of it. So I am teaching the skills, but also trying to teach people as, you know, young students in their late teens, early twenties, what it looks like to be a manager, because now I am in the millennial age group and we are still viewed as relatively young for being in management. And there was not a great deal of preparation on the front end to get us up to speed on what we needed to do. Got it. Uh, you mentioned the concept of quality care. So what does quality health care mean to you? I used to think it was all patient driven. And don't get me wrong, there 
is about the quality measures. There's metrics we need to be monitoring. There's data for us to view. Quality patient care has transitioned over the past 10 years of my career from making sure that the staff feel valued and the workplace and they feel heard and their inputs are being taken into consideration, which then will translate into them being happy in the workplace, ultimately making the residents or the patients happy. So quality is all about ensuring processes, training, and staff or employee engagement are in line in order to make the residents happy because really everything flows very smoothly if you can get the staff to be happy in their position within the community. Okay, um, what I hear you saying is that it's not about, it's not just about the patient experience, but it's also about the professional experience. Yes. And I mean, one of the things that I've, I've heard is, you know, who, ta- who cares for the caregivers? And it is very difficult to care for other people when you are not feeling cared for yourself. Is that properly summarizing what you're talking about? Yes. And, you know, when I first started my career, the most common question I would get from a CNA or a dietary aide would be, um, what is your wage? Now, the most common question I'm getting is, what is your management like? What is my, what is your environment like? What kind of support am I going to get throughout the day? So especially because of the pandemic and the staffing crisis that most people are experiencing, staff don't feel valued and they feel like a number and they really can ultimately go anywhere to find a job. You know, in Des Moines, you could really drive down any of the main streets and anywhere is hiring. So what are we doing in long-term care at my building to want to draw people to want to work there? And it has been about staff engagement and making them feel valued. So just a couple of examples of things that we do throughout the day. Okay. All of the management will go and assist at mealtimes. Mealtimes are chaotic. You know, you've got people, we got 40 people who are trying to come in and out of their rooms, but they need assistance. There's only four CNAs and 40 residents. So we need all hands on deck. Those little things, me lending 15 to 20 minutes of my time to go help at mealtimes does not imp- put an imposition on my day, but it, it sets a different mindset for those CNAs and those dietary aides that they feel valued and that we care what their day-to-day looks like. So that's just a very basic example of something that we do to enhance the quality for the staff and the residents in our community. Okay. And in doing that, there are two things that I'm kind of thinking about from that perspective. Number one is the work that they're doing is not quote unquote beneath you because you are going to do the same work that they are. And you're saying, this is work that we're all here together to do. And we're all on the same team. Um, And number two, you're, you're fostering that team concept by saying the most difficult part of your day, I'm going to be there to be part of that and help alleviate the burden. How does that resonate with you? That is exactly what we're shooting for because what we're ultimately trying to do, I mean, healthcare is a fragile ecosystem right now. It's more fragile than ever. People are aging rapidly and are needing more care and the funds in order for people to do so are reducing, you know, we're seeing patients or residents come in with less funds, but need more care Mm -hmm. and less staff to do so. And so in order to make sure that we're providing quality care, we need to be able to support the team in a way that's going to be meaningful for them. And that ultimately will create the culture that I am trying to provide for the entire community as well as for the future of the community. I mean, we opened in April of last year. So I had to be um, in charge of building a culture from the ground up. And I I could do it any way that I wanted. And I chose to do it with an open environment of communication, um, being in the trenches together. And just as you said, there's no task that is beneath me. I can take my trash out just like my housekeeper can for me. It does not matter what my title is. And that has mattered now more than ever to the workforce for them to feel valued. Yeah. And I I think that one of the things that has become evident as we've done interviews here is that one of the most frustrating parts for professionals in the healthcare system is literally the system. And so what you're doing, you're talking about creating a paradigm in which the system 
values its people. It makes the people feel um, heard and it makes them feel important. And that's going to change ultimately the way that, that the satisfaction that they have with their jobs and the more satisfied they are with their job, the happier they are in their environment, the better they're going to be able to take care of the people that they serve. So um, kudos to you on that. Um, you already kind of answered this question, um, but can you give me an example of quality healthcare? An example would be, um, you know, I had used the meals in as an example. Um, another one that I could think of is involving the direct care teams in meetings for quality improvement. So there's a regulation in long-term care that requires us to identify a problem and then find solutions for it. It's a formalized process. It's actually called QAPI. It's another goofy acronym, um, but most places don't do it well. It just becomes another example of management sitting in a meeting, talking about the problems, trying to find a solution to actually effectively do it the way that it is meant to be and how the federal government intends it to be. You know, it needs to have the involvement from the CNAs. It needs to have the involvement from the nurses. It needs to have involvement from the housekeepers and people from different shifts with different perspectives. Mm. So we're actually just following the regulation as it should be. But this is not the first community that I've worked at. And this is, but this is the first time it has actually been done and adhered to the way that it should be. So it just may sound very basic that we identify a set of problems and then we find solutions to it. But the collaborative effort from not only the management, but also the direct care team is very much invaluable because they feel heard and we can actually, they can see their initiatives or their suggestions being implemented into daily practices, which is highly rewarding for them. No doubt about it. So number one, you and I are definitely on the same page with this. The whole concept of perf perspectives on healthcare is to bring in people who are doing different parts of the job. And so we can hear from everyone and you can learn from other people who, uh, whose work you might not understand. And so you bringing in multiple people with multiple perspectives is phenomenal. And then, you know, just that, listen, I've been in organizations where they have meetings and they call them brainstorming meetings, but most of the time they're blame storming. They're looking, they look at a problem and instead of trying to find a solution, they just try and figure out who they should blame for it. Um, and yeah, the, the amount of productivity that comes out of those is relatively small. What do you wish people understood about your role in healthcare? My role might sound like a schmoozy title because when I tell people what I do or my husband tells people what I do, they automatically have this misconception of I sit in some fancy office with all the windows and I don't do anything but delegate all day. And that could not be further from the truth. So anyone who actually listens to this podcast and is working in long-term care, I feel like they'll probably be able to re relate to me on this level because my role is so much more about doing. You won't see me in my office because I'm out there talking to the residents I'm out there meeting with staff. I'm leading investigations. I am helping with the admissions. I'm assisting at mealtimes. It's, there are so many more hats worn in a day than people realize. And I honestly attribute a great deal of the turnover in my position, um, especially with the pandemic and the staffing crisis to people thinking that the position is going to be more executive based, but it is much more doing based. So if you are looking for a position that is disengaged and um, you're kind of in your own bubble, this is definitely not it. So that is something that I didn't even understand when I started the job. I was totally naive to what my day-to-day -day would look like and I've stuck with it and I've, I've fine-tuned processes and I've certainly learned along the way, but I came in with that same mindset that most other people have. Um, you sit in an office and you don't do much when that couldn't be further from the truth. Sure. And I mean, at the end of the day, there are two sets of people that ultimately matter in your position. Number one is the residents, because with no residents, there's no need for your position at all. And number two is 
your staff, because if your staff is not doing a good job taking care of the residents, then again, there's no need for your position at all. And it, so it sounds to me like you are heavily investing your time in both the residents and the staff, which makes perfect sense. And yet is something that is sadly not happening in all situations. Uh, what excites you about the future of healthcare? We're at a pivotal moment in healthcare right now. People are either running from it, like I said, or they're um, staying in it because they're in it for the right reasons. Like my current medical director said that, and he couldn't be um, more correct. People that have maintained staying in this job, they're in it because their heart's in it, or they honestly don't know what else to do with their life. So mm -hmm. they're just going to continue sticking this out. Other people have just run for the hills. So this is exciting for me because I have never seen as many young executive directors and, or administrators or healthcare leaders be of younger ages than I do right now. And with the right amount of training and guidance, these people can blossom and bloom into the leaders that these organizations need, but it's all going to come down to gifting them with the proper training and the systems so that they can be successful. So I'm looking at this as an exciting time because there's young leaders coming into the industry. The caveat is they deserve and they need the support and the guidance in order for them to be successful in their roles. Yeah, um, a well-made point. What is one thing medical professionals can start doing today to improve the quality of healthcare? Burnout is so prevalent right now. And the first thing and the sole thing that organizations should be doing is looking at ways to effectively combat that. It is such a problem right now that we have to focus on it as leaders and be honest with ourselves, even if we're burned out and do the little things that we can for self-care. I know self-care is a relative term. It can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But if we don't start to address burnout and figure out how to take care of ourselves, I do grow concerned about what the healthcare industry looks like because people are going to be scared of being in it, knowing that, you know, the doomsday of potential burnout is there. So I could not stress more about medical professionals needing to hone in on burnout and trying to make sure that their team feels valued and taking the proper steps to continue addressing burnout. Cause I don't see it going away for a while. Do you have any thoughts about the root causes of burnout? Like what is, what makes this happen? People feel like they give so much of themselves and then don't get anything back. When some, when an organization is needing so much from you and so many other people are needing things from you and processes are broken and there's lack of efficiency people succumb to the burnout. So it has to start with accountability, setting expectations, having empathy for our staff. I mean, we are so quick to judge without understanding the basic reasons why something is happening with someone. And that just starts with a basic conversation. So we need to focus on those basic things. Systems is not something new. I'm not saying anything um, mind blowing and treating people with respect and having proper employee engagement right now are all things that can address burnout, but it takes energy and effort to actually focus on it and do something about it instead of just talk about it. Yeah. In some ways, I, the analogy that I see is it's like the dead sea where everything, you know, the, all of the other things flow in there and there's no release valve for it. And so the mm -hmm. toxicity builds up in there to the point where the Dead Sea can no longer sustain life because it's just full of toxicity and the life sustaining ability is, is gone. So I, I think that it's, it's, there's a similar analogy there to what's going on with burnout for folks in the healthcare arena. So listen, um, Melinda Schulteis, thank you so much for being with me today. Uh, I appreciate you being here. Uh, I will remind my listeners, there are, <laughs> there's a mistake in Apple iTunes, that there are two feeds for this. Um, make sure that you go to the website, perspectivesonhealthcare.com, and subscribe to the right one, because at the end of the year, the wrong one is going away. So I want you to make sure that you don't miss any future episodes. Melinda, thank you for being here. I appreciate you, and I appreciate you sharing your perspective 
on healthcare. Thanks for listening to Perspectives on Healthcare. Visit perspectivesonhealthcare.com to learn more about Rob Oliver or to subscribe so you never miss an episode. If this podcast was valuable, we'd appreciate a review on iTunes. Or welcome if you tell to a friend or coworker about the show, that would be helpful too. Join us again next time for more Perspectives on Healthcare.